Welcome to the Sergio Distinguished Speaker Series with our guest speaker tonight, Natalie Zeman Davis, class of 45, an extraordinarily distinguished historian, teacher, critic, world traveler, um, brilliant writer, and uh, a marvelous individual. I've had a lovely time talking with her on the way in from the airport, and uh, it's very exciting. I've been waiting for her to come for a whole year, and it's very exciting now to contemplate the fact that she will be speaking to us shortly. I'd like to note first, though, I'd like to thank a few people, and I would like to point out that we're going to have books for sale. Some of her books are for sale, uh, thanks to Jan Rielitz, and I'd like to thank her for organizing this out on our table uh, after the lecture is over. Uh, and I do hope that uh, there will be questions and answers at the end of the lecture time, and I know there are a lot of students here who uh, will have good questions, and I know there are lots of others who will have questions of varying kinds, of very different kinds. I'd also like to thank Liz Lent, who with the PR office at Cranbrook House, who has done a superb job in working to advertise and to, and to get the word out. And uh, she's been indefatigable and she's been terrific to work with. And so, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Robert Murphy, who is responsible for this space and for setting up the, for this evening. Uh, it's been terrific uh, to have him and to be working with him. Um, and now I'd like to go ahead and uh, with my introduction, it's going to be a little unorthodox, I think, uh, for this reason. I, I would like to talk about Chris Sergio for just a minute. But um, I would like to point out that there is a program, and I hope that everyone has a copy of this program. I had difficulty knowing how to introduce our speaker. Um, her career is an astounding career. And I felt if I tried to cut this a little bit, to compress it, not tell the whole story, that I would be really not, uh, not good. I would, it would not be good history. It would not be uh, true. And so uh, I decided that I would not go in that direction. So I, I invite you to look at this program, to look at this career. This is an astonishing career. Uh, she, has, she has worked in many different places. She has received degrees from many universities. If I were to publish her list of publications, it would cover four pages. She's written books, several books. Uh, the Return of Martin Gare, which I think is a brilliant book. Um, and so I, I thought, I, I hope the program will substitute in some way for speaking about her. Um, Chris Sergio graduated from Cranbrook School in 1983. Chris was a fine scholar and a fine athlete. A very enthusiastic person. He was a boarding student while he was here. He loved the school. He had one, one of the most wonderful times, and he talks about that openly. He knew how to be a student in this school. He enjoyed himself and did extremely well. Now he's living in Vienna. He's involved with an international corporation. Uh, he was living in Geneva, Switzerland, and then the corporation moved him to Vienna and gave him more responsibility. And so I'm hoping that at this point, Chris is out on a ski slope somewhere because uh, that's one thing he loves to do. Um, but while he was here at Cranbrook, he, he said when visitors came to the campus to talk, to talk about their careers or about their interests, to bring ideas in, uh, to inspire students, he said that was one of the most memorable things that happened to him in his four years. And he said, I want to do the same thing for the students who are here now. And even though he's a relatively young man, to be thinking about giving back to his school, Chris has done it in a grand way. And so wherever you are, Chris, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be the faculty liaison person for this, um, to be able to bring these very wonderful people here to our school and to have our students see them, listen to them, get to know them. I felt the way to introduce Natalie tonight would be to bring in the, the New York Times Magazine for October 17th. They've been doing a series on the millennium and so I thought I'd bring the object in here, my original source, and um, talk briefly about this. Years ago when I was reading The Return of Martin Gare, and I read the first chapter about how the Gare family moves from the Basque region over into southern France, I was thinking this is an incredible history. Um, I haven't ever seen anything quite like this happen to me from reading a history book. 
And the film, when you see the film, the film is a, it's, it's a, it's a very moving and, and beautifully told story, and the acting is, is terrific, but I think there's a real problem with the coherence of the main character. The imposter doesn't make perfect sense, at least not to me. And uh, when I read the book, the book did make, did make that character make more sense, uh, in a way. The, the, the history book really came after the film, it was somewhat inspired by Natalie's work on the film, and it made the film, it reflected back why the film in some ways did not tell the story properly, but in other ways how, this, how it told the story beautifully. Um, so one says, well, The Return of Martin Gare is a wonderful story, and it's a nice film, and it's a terrific book, and so there you are. Um, but I was reading in this magazine, and there's a little part in here about tags, it's called, and this, it's not a big piece, but it's reasonably big, about after the, after the medieval time into the Renaissance, it became more important for people to have an identity of some kind. They were not part of a corporation. They, they, had, to, they had to distinguish themselves from those around them. There was a lot of mobility and uh, new ideas coming in, and so you had to have something like a surname or a passport or a signature or some seal or a coat of arms or something. Um, and the comment that is made here is that in the early modern period, the most famous case of imposture, because as soon as you have insignia or something identifying who you are, then you can be impersonated. Somebody can take over your, your character, your, your identity, can displace you in a sense, can take over your wife and your child, and take over your inheritance. Um, that was a doable thing. and so. The writers in the, in, the, in the magazine say, well, the most famous case of this kind of imposture is the story of Martin Guerre. And so I was thinking to myself, here is a case where a story that is kind of like a folktale gets picked up by a filmmaker, gets turned into a popular film, which a certain segment of your audience will, uh, your, your population will go and see. But then a first-rate historian gets a hold of this story and writes a book about it. And that book becomes a usable text. And all of a sudden, what has happened is, is that a story that is like a book tale <coughs> becomes one of the key guideposts in history. And that when people are trying to think and characterize a period, they turn to this story because there is the book that indicates that this is to be trusted. <coughs> so we have our speaker tonight is a teacher of history. She's a writer of history. But I think one of the most remarkable things about her is that she's a maker of history. So, Natalie, would you please come and talk to us? Would you please welcome Natalie? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff Welch, uh, for that gracious introduction and for that story, which I somehow missed. In in the uh, New York Times millennium. It's a very great pleasure to be back at Cranbrook, Kingswood, uh, very different from my years in the early 1940s, but as beautiful as ever. It's a wonderful evening, uh, with students looking very different, but as exciting and interesting as ever. I look forward very much to the chance to talk to you tomorrow. A pleasure to see old friends, to see faculty once again, to see classmates, to see people I even went to grade school with. I think this is really a very uh, special family evening in many different ways. I wanted to share with you, since I know a, a number of you have recently read The Return of Martin Gare and seen the film, I wanted to share with you some of my own adventures, quarrels, good times, in being a historian working on a film in hopes that we can have some back and forth about it uh, afterward. I first came across the story of Martin Gare when I was teaching a course at the University of California back uh, in the, in the mid-1970s. And it was a course on family, kin, social structure. And one of my students brought into the seminar a book that she had found in the rare book library by a certain judge named Jean de Corras. And she said, this is a fascinating book. Uh, what do you make of it? I read it. 
and I thought, without a moment's missing, this has got to be a movie. Well, there it was, a perfect storyline. Uh, a man disappears, leaves his wealthy, uh, well, prosperous, we should say, peasant family, isn't heard from her for eight or nine years, comes back or seems to come back. His wife with their little boy welcomes him. He's welcomed by the whole village and the family. They have an amicable marriage. Three, four years later, a famous court case occurs in which she now says he's not her husband at all. Perfect storyline, it seemed to me. Uh, a, the kind of story that could make the 16th century come alive, not just in the classroom, but for thousands, maybe millions of people who might not know much about peasant life in the 16th century uh, otherwise. And for an historian like myself, who had up till then primarily worked on lower classes, the peasants, the artisans, the women, about whom it's often harder to find information. It was also a gold mine. Here were the voices of women and peasants speaking through this court case, at least indirectly through this court case. And then it had another thing that I loved about it. It had the peasants and a peasant woman in interchange and in conflict with judges, members of the new nobility. A wonderful chance to see relationships across the lines of social hierarchy. It just seemed like you know, a gift from heaven to find a story like this. The other thing that made me say, this has got to be a movie instead of, gee, this has got to be a book, was not only the chance to re reach lots of people, but also beginning to think about how you could tell about history differently from prose. Whether it would be possible to tell a meaningful and true story through enactment. And I had begun to see some filmmakers doing that. And I thought, hey, that's a kind of history writing. So the next thing that I knew a few years later, partly encouraged by some of my students at Princeton, where I then was, I was in Paris with this pl plan for a film about Martin Gare, looking for a director when I discovered, by accident almost, that Jean-Claude Carrière and Daniel V, that very week, had decided to make a movie about the story of Martin Gare. Uh, I was stunned. Uh, I dried my tears rapidly, however, and said, well, I'm going to work with them. And by luck, they had ha happened to have heard of my own work, not on Martin Gare, because I hadn't published it, but some other things I published, and welcomed me uh, to the team, which then researched and wrote, uh, and then ultimately made uh, this film. At the time, I didn't know much about them. But let me say a word about where they were coming from. Jean-Claude Carrière, who was the main scriptwriter and a very accomplished one, had studied history in his student days in the southwest of France. He was from Martin Gare country. He didn't, he didn't live right in the same village, but he was from that Languedoc uh, region and was very experienced. Some of you may know the name of Peter Brook, who was in the Bouffe du Nord in Paris, a very, very celebrated director. And in addition to film work, Jean-Claude Carrière had worked with him and on many films that you've seen. Daniel Bean, young at the time, was mostly known for his wonderful work in filming the countryside and French peasants. So he brought that sense of the people, of the rural people, to him. Well, we worked and worked on this film uh, together, and we agreed on certain things about the story, since I'm, I'm assuming that most of you know it, apart from my big outline. We agreed that that imposture could not have worked if in some sense Bertrand de Rolls, the wife of the real Martin Gare, had not been complicit. Maybe not right away, uh, but at some, maybe only semi-consciously right away, but at some point she became his companion in presenting him to the world as Martin Gare and helping him have the memories of Martin Gare and ultimately, and we'll come back to this, uh, making it possible, she hoped, for him to win the case as Martin Gare. We agreed on that, and that had never been said before in any of the 
retellings orally or in fiction form uh, over the centuries. She'd always, or the retellings, the reprintings of the court case, she'd always been presented as maybe innocent, maybe not so innocent, but as a passive dupe. Well, I like that idea, uh, partly because I'm the kind of historian who likes to see people, even poor people, even working people, as agents, as active in their own life, and not just as victims and passive. And I have to say that I like it all the more, maybe this is my Kingswood background and my Smith College background, because it was a woman being active. And I thought, well, these peasant women may have a hard time, but they can do something to help change their life. The other thing that Jean-Claude and Danielle and I agreed upon was wanting this film to show the sense of the possible in history. That even though we may have lots of constraints today or in the past, even though times may seem very limited, resources very narrow, that the possible can be there, that one can imagine and try to do something different. And we, we wanted to see, in a way, this film, in this film, this story of this invented marriage between the imposter and Bertrand as something that suggested, at least for a time, an opening in human life. Uh, we also, to me, it was also quite important that it was in the moment not just of the Renaissance, but of the Protestant Reformation, which became very bloody and very, very conflictful, a uh, terrible civil war in France. But in its opening years, even though it was denounced as heresy by the Catholic uh, hierarchy, brought a sense of the new, the possible. So those were the two things we agreed on. I tried really hard to get them to agree on a third thing. And I called it the plausibility principle. And here was the idea that any time in this film when we had to do something that we didn't know whether it had happened or not, and, and when you're writing a film, and some of you perhaps are very interested in doing this yourselves, you know that you <coughs> often have to invent things. Any time that we were inventing, I wanted us to invent something that could have happened in the 16th century, even if we know, didn't know that it did, that was plausible, not anachronistic. And I tried to get them to agree, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about where that, where we didn't, where it didn't work out that way. I should say also that they tried to get me to agree on a principle that I called the camel's foot principle. And that was as follows. I would go rattling on and on and on and on and on about the 16th century as we were working on the script and this, that, and the other thing, things we should put into this movie. And Jean-Claude said to me, you know, Natalie, the best movie I ever saw about the Sahara Desert was a movie in which all you had was a camel putting its foot into a piece of sand. That's all you need to know. So I called that the camel principle and tried not to t tell them too much. But let's go back to the plausibility principle. I thought it would be interesting for you to hear about some of the ways in which uh, we worked, either to make things plausible or sometimes where they did, became implausible and how it happened. Let me give you an example of, of, first of all, of plausibility. At first, I wanted to make sure that the audience knew that the language that people were speaking in the southwest of France was not the French that we're learning in our classes that we speak today, that it was a special regional language called the long dog. Jean-Claude said, and I said, let's just do one scene. Jean-Claude said, forget it. You want the audience to understand this movie. We're not going to go into long dog. We were writing this in French. So what we did do, and we did it really quite well, for those of you who can hear the French as you're seeing it, is that every line in that film is a line that could be said in the 16th century. There are no, and it's got a certain purity about it, there are no anachronistic terms. There are proverbs from the 16th century, there are sayings from the 16th century, but the words, when people swear at each other, they're swearing, they're saying things like, you boo, gross. Those are 16th century swear words. And that was an example of kind of, of a nice, elegant plausibility. Here's another example. Uh, again, I'm, I'm assuming that some of you remember different moments in the film. You'll recall uh, that, uh, and in the book as well, that at one point, the imposter remembered, during the trial, when he's being 
tried for being an imposter. The imposter remembers the past of Martin Gare, the real Martin Gare, so perfectly that the judges begin to suspect witchcraft because Bertrand, the historical Bertrand, not the movie Bertrand, is always saying he's not my husband, but she's telling stories about the past that he can always repeat. Well, in the, in the first version of the script, Jean-Claude Carrier didn't want Jean de Carras, the Protestant judge, to believe in witchcraft. He didn't want him to say it must be witchcraft, because Jean-Claude is an enlightened Protestant himself, and he wanted to think of the Protestant tradition of the 18th century, where people believed in tolerance. He didn't want to think of the 16th century Protestant tradition, when all the Protestants believed definitely in witchcraft and were prosecuting witches. So he had a line, I'm back to the movie now, in the movie in which, uh, uh, Jean, in which the Catholic judge says, maybe it's witchcraft. That's how he knows all the past of Martin Gere. And Jean-Claude had this line saying, oh, you Catholics. Anytime you don't understand anything, you blame it on witchcraft. I said, Jean-Claude, you can't say that in the 16th century. John Calvin, the founder of Protestantism in France, is pros prosecuting witches. Jean de Carras says in his book, he believes that maybe it was witchcraft. That, uh, which, uh, and so Jean-Claude, he reluctantly gave up his enlightened, tolerant Protestant, and we wrote another line. I couldn't get him to say the witchcraft line. We took a line from another 16th century lawyer, a, a wonderful lawyer named Montaigne, and we put a line in saying, uh, lies have many faces, but the truth has only one. And it's up to us judges to find the truth. So that's how we got around that conflict. Uh, we sort of skirted around, but we got a good 16th century line in. Now here's some examples of ways in which uh, the film departs from, from actuality. And I thought you'd be interested in hearing the different ways in which it happened. Sometimes it was just by accident. But the first way was an argument between, a real argument that I lost, between me and Danielle Bean. You'll remember that when Bertrand de Rolls marries the real Martin Gare, they're very young. She's barely 12. He's a little tiny bit older. And you'll recall from the film, and from the historic history, too, that he was unable to have intercourse with her. He was impotent for years. Uh, in history, the historical situation, they finally brought in a wise woman, a kind of uh, a, a woman healer, to say certain magical things over him, and has some religious ceremony. And it finally worked. But for the movie, Daniel Bean wanted to have the scene which you see of the two of them stripped naked and being flagellated by, not given the mass by the priest, which is what really happened, but flagellated. And, if that was, and in the movie, that, as you've seen it, that works. I said to him at the time, Daniel, this is impossible. This is early libertinism. This is the Marquis de Sade. You're 200 years too early. This could not happen. He said, I want to film those bare shoulders. I said, no. <laughs> we argued and we argued, and he was the director, and he won. And there's, so what I did for that was, the priest is at least saying, as he wrongly flagellates, a true exorcism prayer. <laughs> so in that scene, the Latin lines are right. Or maybe they're in French. No, they're in Latin, I think, of it. But the flagellation, so that was just a lost argument. It's, it's, it's wrong because it just completely misses the sexual, the erotic sensibility of the 16th century. This is a century that still believes deeply in religious asceticism, which still has flagellation in the monasteries and, and fasting in the monasteries, so people can control the flesh. Anyway, that was a, a second uh, thing that happens that is not that is, is, is a departure from the historical record that I think is okay, is when you see Bertrand writing her name. You remember that scene. The imposter comes back. She's welcomed him as the real Martin Gare. And in one scene, which is quite a beautiful scene, he teaches her, to her delight and joy, how to write her name. Now, this is in a time when maybe 
2% of all women in France uh, could sign, 2% of peasant women, let's say, which is the majority, could write their names. Most men and most women are illiterate, and the women are more illiterate than the men, except in the upper classes, where it's a different, a different story. In fact, Bert, for the real Bertrand, the historical Bertrand, probably couldn't sign her name. I've been through all the records in that village. I have found one or two women who could sign. It's about right for the whole century. I've never found that Bertrand could sign. But that seemed to me, though invented for the film, plausible. That is, there are a few women that could do it. A man like Arnaud might have come back literate. It did sometimes happen. And in the film, we have Bertrand just thrilled uh, to have that, to have that, that learning, to have that power to write her name, something that most women don't have and most peasants don't have. So there was a place where we departed from, perhaps from historical reality, which I certainly went along with, and that made, I think, quite a lovely uh, scene. Third thing uh, that uh, departs from reality, uh, that I was complicit with, although I wouldn't do it again, in the film, you'll recall, when the imposter is, looks as though he's going to win his case, and then into that courtroom comes the man with the wooden leg. For those of you who haven't read this book or seen the film, the real Martin Gare had lost his leg in a battle, and he has a wooden leg. And this scene is, is really quite wonderful when you hear this, in comes this wooden leg into the court. It was I think was that what scene that made me really especially want to make this, this film. Well, in the film, they know each other. In the film, Arno, the imposter, you'll recall, has got the first business of the story from being a comrade in arms with Martin Gare. And when they confront each other in the film, uh, uh, Martin accuses him of breaking his friendship. Well, at the time we were writing the script, I pretty much knew that that was unlikely. At that point, I hadn't done the research to discover that it was probably not possible at all that they ever knew each other. They weren't even in the same, fighting in the same army. They were fighting on enemy armies. But it was at least possible, uh, uh, unlikely, maybe 15%, 20%. But at the time we started, they liked the idea of the, of the broken friendship between the two men, the men who had been comrades, and one betrays the other. I kind of liked the idea. And I thought it would make an interesting confrontation of, friend, of male friends, one having betrayed the other. But then, along the way, I discovered the firm evidence that they really couldn't have known each other. And even more important, or at least as important, I saw Gérard Depardieu playing Arnaud de Tille, playing the imposter, playing Martin Gare. And when that happened, I realized that it was much more likely that you could be a good imposter, a successful imposter, and believe, as Arno Dutti did practically to the end, that you really were the other person if you'd never seen him, if you'd never met him. You could take himself into you, build, build your, your life as another person, believing it. And maybe in the question period, we can come back to this idea of of imposters who believe they really are someone else. At any rate, it was seeing Gerard Depardieu do that that made me understand what I was finding more and more in the historical records. So that, that one I was complicit with. I didn't particularly oppose that. I, I warned them about it, but we did it. The fourth departure uh, is one that happened by accident. And for me as an historian, it's really sort of embarrassing. <coughs> Uh, this is something many of you may not have noticed in the film, uh, because it's rather special to French history. But if you recall the court scene in the movie, uh, the imposter uh, is sitting up there in the front, and the whole village, his opponents and his supporters, his wife, i.e. with quote marks, everybody is standing at the back of the room. They're waving at him, or they're frowning at him. They're running up to what's called the parking. They're running up to the front. And it's a, it's a sort of social event. Now, French criminal justice is a secret justice. The only people who are in the courtroom during a trial are the judges, the scribes, 
the sergeants who may take the witness off to be tortured if there's a, a torture sentence, and the actual people who are being, uh, in, about whom an inquiry is being made. It's scary. It's very scary, especially scary for a peasant to be faced with a situation like that. And I knew that. I knew that French criminal justice was secret. In fact, any historian knows it because one of the great demands of the French Revolution was that French criminal justice stop being secret and be open the way it is today. Well, how did it happen? Well, it happened because Danielle and I got carried away with creating a courtroom that was going to be exactly like the 16th century. Expensive, but accurate. And we should have known. We should have known that the cheap path would have been a better path. Because once it had been constructed at great expense, with the renting a palace in, uh, uh, in the south of France, especially so that we could do it, because the actual court is, is, is still in use. We couldn't do it in film in the real court because they're still having cases there. This very elaborate room with paintings and so forth. And Dondell started to film in that room. The acoustics were terrible. It was much too big. Any place the camera looked was empty space. It would be like up here. So Danielle said, this is impossible. And we didn't have at the time or the money to redo it all and reconstruct it all the, all the court cases in a small, intimate room, which is what we should have done. So he just said, OK, bring in the villagers. So what should have been a scary criminal justice, as though you, know, you were by yourself this big panel, is this kind of down folks home scene. And as I say for an historian, if you're teaching this, and if any history professors use it, would you just tell your students it's not like that? Uh, that doesn't affect me. I would even say that it affects the story a little bit. Because the achievement of the real imposter, the historical imposter, was that he kept his cool in this very scary situation very ominous, always with the threat of torture over his head, and he still managed to persuade the judges until the real Martin Gare appeared that he was the real Martin Gare. He almost got away with it. Well, the, um, the, other, the last thing I want to mention, uh, maybe in some ways the most important, uh, has to do in the departure from the historical record, has to do with Bertrand de Rose. And I said a few moments ago, rather quickly, that the historical Bertrand, the one that you read about in the book, never did denounce, brought the trial case against the imposter. In the film, you'll recall, you think for a minute she is the plaintiff. But then you'll rem again remember in the film, she shows that she is not the plaintiff, that it was that her signature, her ex, was forged. And you'll remember again in the film when the judge says, well, what do you, how do you know? And she said, because I would have signed my name if I had really been the plaintiff in the case. And then in the film, you'll recall, the story goes on that she always supports uh, the, the imposter during the trial and only changes her mind when the man with the wooden leg appears. But the historical Bertrand, having tried to defend this man, for, for as long as she could, finally, again, as I suggested in the writing of the book, faced with a very dangerous situation where she could lose her children, where she might be condemned to death for her complicity and for adultery and all the rest, finally decided to play a very shrewd game, placating Pierre Guerre, the uncle, the patriarch of the family, by bringing the case claiming to be totally innocent so that no one could accuse her of complicity, but giving testimony clearly in that court case such that it could always be repeated by Arno. So she tries to clear herself and make it possible for him to win and get the troublesome patriarch. Well, Jean-Claude just couldn't see this. He kept saying, why did she bring the case? Why did she bring the case? Why was she a plaintiff? And I said, well, First of all, there's religion. Uh, she was a Catholic. We, we, I actually think she begins to be a pro Protestant, but she was a religious woman. Well, he plugs that into the movie for a minute. There's, we have a line ab uh, about that. And I kept trying to explain to him what it would be like to be a 16th century peasant woman who doesn't have the luxury of romantic love forever, 
who's caught between two powerful men, the imposter, her, who she prefers as her husband, and the great patriarch of the family, the Pierre, and then she's a peasant woman. She's not a free agent. She has to find the best way to save her honor and her reputation. Interestingly enough, Jean-Claude, Jean-Claude just, he never really saw it. I, could have, I keep thinking if I could have explained it to him better. Uh, maybe it was my fault. I just couldn't get the history through to him. He said, no, it's too complicated. He really wanted her to be loyal to, to not to be, to play a double game, not to be concerned so much about her own reputation, but to be rom romantically loyal to the imposter. So he had the scenario book under his hand, and that's the way it was. Uh, it's done in the film uh, in a way that departs from the rather complex, savvy, crafty, but I think realistic 16th century peasant woman. So what I said to Jean-Claude at that point was, okay, if you, you win, we'll have your bear drawn. Let me rewrite the lines that you've given her in regard to this man so that she doesn't seem to be defending him as if she were a 19th century romantic woman. Let me, let me, uh, let me put her back into the 16th century. And, and I secondly said, and I'm gonna write a book about this. So I began to write the book, not after the film, but just as we were doing the scenario. I said, you know, I'm finding so much about this case that we can't put in the movie, and I don't agree with what you're doing in Bertrand. I'm gonna write a book about it. They said, fine, it'll help the publicity. And in fact, it did. But the two worked together. So, so I was actually, from then on, I had my film hat and my book hat. Uh, but it was partly because I wanted, it was because especially of Bertrand, and then, and then in addition, because it seemed to me there were a lot of other aspects of the story which couldn't be covered in the film. The film covers some of them wonderfully. So what, so what I did, and Jean-Claude let me do this, was take out lines you, you, uh, in which, at the very end of the movie, you'll recall that Bertrand is saying to the judge who is asking her, well, tell me the truth. I will never go beyond this room. Tell me the truth. Uh, how did you feel about him? You knew he was an imp imposter. And Jean-Claude had written lines that were very loving and sexual uh, that you would never say in the 16th century. And so I took lines of those kinds and I simply wrote them as I, as a, as a peasant woman might say them if she were like the Bertrand he wanted. So that you get lines like, the other one treated me with disrespect. The other one, the other one, uh, this one respected me. Uh, we were, and instead of saying, we, were, we fell in love with each other, the lines are, nous étions bien ensemble, we were good together, something very simple uh, that would be more like what a peasant woman would say. So I tried to create her, as I say, with Jean-Claude's complete cooperation, as a 16th century woman who was loyal to her man. Uh, interestingly enough, when Natalie Bai started playing that part, I had a, a, the chance to talk to most of the actors. Uh, they were very, very interesting, each with his or her own approach. You can ask me about that later if you want to hear about Gerard Depardieu. But uh, Natalie Bai said, you know, the one thing I can't understand about Bertrand is why she waited for so long to, to turn against him, and that is to make a complaint about him. Uh, she said, I don't think, and Natalie Bai herself was from the Basque country, which is where the, the Gares came from. She said, I just don't think a peasant woman would take a risk like that in the 16th century. Uh, I said, you're right. <laughs> She didn't, the historical bear drawing. And I always felt that Natalie Bai played that role uh, with more of the complexity of the historical bear drawing. Uh, she went beyond many of the lines. Well, uh, I wanted to just conclude uh, mm -hmm. by telling you a little bit about, just very briefly, uh, about the book I'm working on right now, uh, because it grew out of this experience of working on Martin Gare. It seemed to me uh, that in many ways, filmmaking is a kind of doing of history. It's a kind of studying of history. And that we make a mistake if we only imagine learning about history from only scholars looking in archives and reading books and talking about it in classrooms, although I think that's a wonderful way to do it too. But that's not the only way, that in a way, you can imagine a film being made 
especially if it's a serious film and the people really care about what they're doing, as a kind of way of studying history, imagining history, having thought experiments about history, doing history. And that that's a perfectly legitimate way for history to be studied, and that when people come to see films in a theater, that's a kind of studying and thinking about history and challenging of history and wondering about history, as much as in different from a classroom. And I really liked that idea. Uh, in, 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 in Martin Gere, it certainly was the case. Each actor had his or her way of, of, of coming to terms with the historical dimension of the film. It meant something to them. Though some of them read books about it and some of them just asked about it. And even in the village where we were filming, it made a difference to them. Uh, we were not feeling, uh, it, it had an impact. The, the fact of reenacting history had some effect on the things that they thought about in their village today. Uh, we were not, by the way, filming in the town of Artigod, the little village, I should call it, where it really happened, because that was too modern. It, it didn't have any good farmhouses. We filmed instead in a, in a higher up Pyrenean town called Balagay. And I have to say that one of the consequences of filming there is that I think the people in Balagay think, believe it really happened in their village. <laughs> That's a bad history lesson, incorrect. But anyway. Well, out of this notion that, that films are a, can be a very powerful and legitimate way of doing good history, came the book I'm currently writing, as we speak, it's coming off my computer, which I'm calling Slaves and Queens on Screen, Film and Historical Vision. And it's an attempt to look at films on the theme of slave revolts, one part, and on women in political power, both queens and some modern women, about whom films have been made, like Eva Perón and Golda Meir, look at several films in each category and say, what have they done, not just what they've done that's wrong historically, that departs from the truth, but what have they done that's really powerful historically? And to give you an example of the kind of thing that I mean, that in films about queens, usually two things always happen. There's lots of ceremony, and there's sex. The queen has always got you know, something about the, the can the woman really be, a, or is she having a, lo a lover? Now, you might think, well, this is what Hollywood does, or this is what movies do, and so what's so interesting about that? But what's interesting about it is that if you look at the historical record, ceremony is deeply important in courses, in courses, in, in, in courts, COU, not courses, but courts, deeply important in the power of kings and queens, more important perhaps than filmmakers even knew when they were making it. And in a funny way, movies were ahead of historians in recognizing the enormous importance of ritual and ceremonial action in building power. I think with our generation, with the TV generation, with the generation used, it's easier to see that. But in the earlier times, people paid attention to the edicts that kings announced, or the laws, or their armies, or their taxes, all very important. But they didn't look at the symbolic side of court life. So in a curious way, movies were ahead of the historians. Now, have any of you seen the movie Elizabeth that came out? Just a few hands are going up. Oh, several hands. So, well, that's a movie loaded with it, mistakes as facts. It really has got a lot of things that didn't happen in it. But it's terrific on the ceremony. And not just trivial, it really shows you the power of ceremonial life and the enactment and what difference it made to people at that echelon of society. Now, what about sex, about love affairs? Here again, this is just standard. This is movies that have to have this, romance. Uh, and many of the movies about the Queen's Mary of Scotland, which is a very good one by John Ford back in 1936. Uh, there's one about Catherine the Great by a very great filmmaker, Stanberg, also from the 30s. Um, Elizabeth and Essex, I mean, all of them have some of this in it. What's interesting about it is that here again, <coughs> we now know from really the, all the new work in the history of women, this issue was important when queens, rather than kings, inherited the throne. And it wasn't just important because of the scandal. It was important for politics. 
Because if women had lovers, if queens had lovers, or even if they married legitimately, what the great nobles always feared was that the woman would be in the hands of her lover. What was dangerous about the lover wasn't the sex, the danger was the influence of, of, that the lover would have, or even the husband, or, and the husband as well. It was a deeply important political issue. So that when films handle this, and this is handled quite well in Elizabeth. As I say, there are a lot of factually things wrong, but this is handled quite well. It's an, it, it, uh, if you look, and, and when it comes up in films like uh, Eva Peron, uh, the Argentinian <coughs> film that was made about two years ago, it's actually done at rather well. It's done with serious attention, not just to the sex part, uh, Eva Peron's interest in, in Peron, but to the political part. What is the implication for power? So that's just to give you a little tiny bit of, of an idea of how films can show some things historically, perhaps even better than prose, or at least as well as prose. Now let me conclude with the point that I'm going to conclude my book with. The last chapter of the book is going to be called Truth Telling. And the argument is, and it's going to be really an appeal to filmmakers, that the best way to get a dramatic film is, I think, to be loyal to the important things in the historical evidence. Not little things. I mean, there are little things that have to be changed around. Historians omit things themselves. They're not supposed to ever change anything around. But historians can't tell everything. You can't tell a whole story. And clearly, if you're having a film and you're reenacting, I'm thinking now of a feature film, there will be ways in which you have to use the imagination. Fine. But films, I would like to uh, get filmmakers to believe, should take, be responsible to, feel responsible, care about telling the past when possible as accurately as they can. And I repeat again that it can make a more dramatic, a more interesting film. Our film, Martin Gare, if we'd had the time, all the time in the world, probably could have been even a better movie if we'd had the historical bear But I'll give you an example that I'm going to use in my, in my <coughs> book. Uh, as my final, I hope you'll agree with me. I don't know if, you're, if any of you would have seen the film Spartacus. It was made by Stanley Kubrick, and it, who was, of course, very much, but the movie itself came out about 1960. Anybody seen that here? You, oh, oh, you, well, <laughs> it has a lot of, it, it, some of its best features are come from Kubrick's skillful hand in, in the gladiator scenes um, and in the extraordinary battle scene at the end in which Spartacus is And there's some other very, very interesting things in the film. But as Roman slaves go, Kirk Douglas, who was very sincerely committed to this film, uh, Tony Curtis and Gene Simmons are not great, historically, in, in, in the way they act and their language especially, as Spartacus and Spartacus's wife, Verinia, and, and Antoninus. Now, they do their best, but it's, it just doesn't come through as the way, even in language, it, does, it, it, it doesn't come through in, in the philosophical statements. Well, for writing this part of the book, I went back and started looking at all the, the source material on Spartacus and his woman. And he did indeed have a woman. It wasn't just invented as a romantic Hollywood story or a uh, story by the, the writers, uh, Howard Fast and uh, uh, Donald Trumbo, he really did have a woman. She was with him from the beginning, even before the gladiator school. But the real wife was a prophetess, a seer, a woman who spoke, predicting the future. And the real Spartacus was a man of wonders and a magical worker. Uh, and the, the, first, the first public presentation of him when he was being sold as a slave in Rome, his wife, who was there too, being sold, says of him, he has a snake curled around his head and predicts great things for the future. And, and of course, that then became a self-fulfilling prophecy as he became a leader of the slaves. Well, I, for those of you who've seen the movie, the old movie, I submit that a woman, not the sweet, loyal, courageous, strong Marinia, as in Spartacus, but this prophetess, this seer, and a wonder-working Spartacus leading those to sleep. Now there's a story. There's a story. I even, maybe some of you will make it one day. I don't want to make a new Spartacus. 
with it. So uh, I think I'll end on that uh, that note of prophecy uh, and uh, that uh, note of expectation and leave these the floor open for questions of, of any kind. I did. Uh, he was very interested in, in self-fashioning, in, in remaking yourself, because he's had that experience in his own life, uh, in his own uh, being an uh, immigrant from Tunisia to France. He loved the story, but he, uh, and he also loves, as does Cameron McIntosh, the producer, stories that connect with great historical events, as in Miss Saigon or Les Miserables. That there's a way to bring in big history which I agree with, too. But what they wanted to do in, in at least the London version was make the Protestant Reformation be the big historical event. So what Alain did was he took my chapter, which I think is right, but it's somewhat speculative in the book where I talk about Mar Mar Martin, uh, the, the imposter in Bertrand as being Protestant, and he ran with it. And in, again, the London version, they are Protestant. And he moved the whole story later into the 16th century so that it could bring in the bloody wars of religion. And uh, there's a, uh, a very complicated uh, putting together of, of Catholicism on the one side and Protestantism on the other, and there's a fight between the Protestants and the Catholics. Uh, so, so he. That, that was one interesting thing. We'll see whether that's still the case uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Fisher Theater uh, performance. Secondly, he did something that, um, there, there are some very good things in, the, in it, by the way. It's, it's worth seeing. But I'm telling you some of the problem areas, or the areas of departure. Secondly, he did something which, to a smaller degree, is done in some of the other, the other two musicals. Uh, the one that played in Toronto and Chicago stays very close to, to much of the historical record. In fact, I helped, uh, did a lot of work on it. But even it wants to soften the story a little bit. Uh, wants people not to be mean, the good guys. It wants to have good guys and bad guys. So in, in Boublil's production, uh, Pierre Gare, the patriarchal uncle, is really bad. He, he isn't human always, he's bad. He's selfish, he's bad. And the more complicated things that, that I see in him historically and that we try to put in our film, that yeah, maybe he's, self, he's greedy and selfish and po wants power, but he's also worried about somebody who lies. Uh, that more complex thing. And in, um, in the, even in the, in the Chicago, Toronto, other musical, uh, 
Bertrand is softened a little so that she doesn't really turn against the imposter. Uh, in, in the London version, in the Fisher Theatre version, at least in the, as I say, I'm always having to bracket it, but I've seen it only in London, um, Arnold de T doesn't even really want to be an imposter. He shows up in the village and he, he kind of just, he, he just came, really just came to tell Bertrand that her husband had died. And then he gets sort of sucked into it. In other words, he doesn't want to go on the perilous path. He's, he's a good guy. Uh, in, the, in the London production, uh, Arno is not hanged. <laughs> he's killed uh, in, in a, he's killed as he tries to save Martin Gare. Can you see how different it is? A, he's not hanged. There's a court case, but they decide he's an imposter, but he doesn't have to be hanged. So which allows him to sort of make it up to Martin Gare. So, so it's sort of, it, it, it's sweeter. And I don't know how you feel about it. I, I feel, let's forget about the fact that it isn't true. I mean, let's, say, let's let him have the run of his imagination, you know. But I, I think he may underestimate the possibility that audiences can accept the fact that things sometimes end tragically. Sometimes they don't end. And look for hope, uh, look for hope in another way, if you wish. Uh, to me, uh, the, uh, the hope in so far as I cared about it in the Martin Gare story as I was writing it, uh, was in the fact that the story got told again and again and again. And I figure that even if things don't work out right, if you tell a story about it over and over again, it keeps a possibility alive. So anyway, those are some of the, the curious things, but I've, it's really got some wonderful singing and dancing in it, and it's got some good, some really, no, it's just like, oh, and it's probably better now, because he feels he's rewritten it so that it's, it's the way, and I look forward to seeing it, maybe I'll try to come to the Fisher Theater in December, mm -hmm. see it in, in my native town. But I hope, I hope that uh, you, you will find it interesting. The only other thing I would say um, is that imposter stories are still in. That's another reason why. So thank you for asking that. Gentlemen, or the lady, excuse me, behind you, or the person behind you, I can't see if it's a man or a woman. Oh, no. <laughs> no. I just can't see, I'm fine. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's very dark back there, yeah. Um, you were talking about trying to make the marriage seem realistic. Yeah. And in, our, in our history books, they say that love was kind of a minor factor in, in you know, marriage in the 16th century. Could you, could you talk a little about romance in the 16th century? Uh, I think that history books that say that love, in the deep sense of the word, were, were invented only in the 18th century are way off. There is considerable evidence of genuine affection in marriage, uh, sometimes even in arranged marriages, where the couple hardly know each other before, uh, which is often the case in the upper class. So, uh, uh, and I tried to suggest this in my book about Bertrand and, and Arno, that there was affection uh, and, and, and a peaceable co uh, marriage, a cooperative uh, marriage. And you can find many examples of, of that. What the 16th century uh, feared was uh, a marriage based only on wild romantic love, which might not last, uh, which might only be based on a kind of, you know, exciting attraction, erotic attraction, but that wouldn't move into genuine, deep-held affection. You do find some marriages where you have that romantic, erotic side. You can find it in diaries. You can find it in, in uh, I mean, you really can. But the, the what you should imagine at its best for that period and for the whole old regime are marriages where a, a real, the Frenchman would say tendresse, where a real, deep abiding love and, and caring for the other person. And the way we can track the fact that it happens is by what people say when they lose a spouse. And we have expressions, not just from upper class people, but you know, literate people lower down, where they are desolate at the loss of a spouse and write with great affection. Now at the other end of the scale, there are horrible marriages. Some of the arranged marriages don't work. People find each other repellent. Some of the marriages, where well, they weren't arranged, just dissolve into terrible quarreling. Uh, and it's particularly complicated by the power structure, which always says, I mean, among other things that complicated, that the husband is the governor of 
the wife. And the wife is subject to her husband, and that's true throughout Western Europe. And that's a real complication uh, in, in these marriages. Uh, and how, how to combine the cooperation and the sharing that goes with raising children, uh, running a farm, uh, and have a situation which is always hierarchical. That can cause lots of trouble. Uh, families find ways of working around it. Some act, you know, act with it. Uh, some ignore it. Some turn it upside down and the woman dominates the husband. Uh, does that give you a little bit of, a, yeah. of an idea? But don't imagine them as all loveless, but imagine them as being suspicious of excessive romantic love and hoping for tendrance. Yes? Have any new facts come out about Martin Pierce since you read the book? And the reason I ask this is because my students speculate that uh, it seems impossible that the two, Arnaud and uh, uh, a Barton. Barton, could have met. But you, you say no. They couldn't have met. Okay, they, they, uh, uh, they. I mean, they might have by chance. But, but, but. Uh, we. This, see, this is in the film. Yeah. But uh, in they were from different villages, and Arno was in the French army, right. and Martin was in the Sp Spanish army, and they weren't at the same battles. Yes, that's right. Uh, and um, secondly, I mean, there's always a possibility that everybody is lying. You know, there's always that possibility. In history, you have to always say something maybe isn't true. But the evidence, not only from Carras, which is what I knew when I started working on the scenario, but from the young lawyer who was the second witness, especially his evidence, is very clear. Uh, and what, what, does, what does happen um, is that there are go-betweens from Arno's village. We don't know exactly who they were who are priming him. There is, there is more to find out about this story. But nothing new has come to light since you read the book that, that's really outstanding. Uh, not yet. I, I, I keep thinking I'm going to go maybe back to the archives and, and, uh, or, or to Spain. And the one thing that, uh, not, no, nothing that, that anybody's found. I mean, I've combed the archives, but maybe there's more that one could find. Maybe there's something more in Spain. The one thing that I understood better myself uh, uh, about it, in connection with being challenged by uh, a historian, a more a very good but very traditional social historian, in an exchange we had in the American Historical Review, and he he, uh, he thought I was being awfully modernistic in my not in my uh, approach, but in my all the new techniques. And we had a very interesting exchange. And in answering him, I understood something more clearly that I hadn't understood before, partly because I had done a book in between on um, the story of pardon, like being pardoned. And I now understood much more about pardon. And I realized that, in a way, what that court was doing with Bertrand and laying all the responsibility on Arno was, in a way, pardoning. And I sort of got, sort of said that in the book, but I understood it much more clearly. And so the point that I made to you before about witchcraft, when I said, you know, it's just crazy for John claude to want to pretend that Coras, the judge, is opposed to witchcraft, all the Calvinists. But I realized when I wrote that answer that his that he probably a he probably did he must have believed in the witchcraft. But b if you want to pardon someone. And your fellow judges are saying, yeah, we'll, par we'll pardon her, but how come, how come he knew all about Martin Gere's past? She must have been feeding him. She must have been complicit. Well, a very good answer is <coughs> witchcraft. He did it by magic, you see? So that something, I now see that the thing that I was trying to defend to Jean-Claude in terms of, but, every, but all the Calvinists believed in magic, in addition, was a good legal way of keeping, of doing something, and to go back to your question, that was, that was very important to the 16th century. They really wanted to keep families together. They believed in the family as the unit. So to keep, to try to restore a family, the husband, the husband who's finally come back, and he abandoned her, to the woman, you gotta have them both be there. But I'm sure somebody will find out something new. <laughs> Maybe somebody else, uh, uh, yes, this woman here. Um, when you were doing research, like for the movie and also before then in France, were yeah. you treated any differently by the French because you're an American doing the French research? In the early days, long before 
you were born. When I first went over for my graduate studies in 1952, <laughs> a long time ago, it was not that long after the war. And the Americans that were working there as scholars, graduate students, were almost all in Paris. I think there was one in Toulouse. I was then working on the town of Lyons, Lyon. And I got there, and except for the US Information Service, I was probably the only American anywhere around the, the libraries with all these students and uh, in the research room. And people then would say to me, what are you doing here? Why aren't you working on American history? They thought it was really weird that I would cross the ocean. And I said, but I love French history. And I think it's, you know, it's part of my, to me, it's part of my past. I learned French history first from Mrs. From Miss Reed in the ninth grade in Kingswood. Still remember what we were reading. I mean, and ever since then. And so I felt, this was what I wanted. This was my past, in a way. The wonderful French, you know, the Enlightenment and the French Revolution and all of this. And they were very nice to me. I was very young, so maybe that made it easier. I was really just a girl in some ways. But they did think it was very, very strange. Now, uh, many foreigners work in French history. And if anything, the Americans are sort of almost, there's so, it's more that we're resented my graduate students all go to the libraries and taking up chairs. But but where there's a lot of collegiality among the groups. Now, uh, and that's in the university world. In the village, when I went to the village of Artigat, uh, the real village, not the movie village, but I actually worked in the archives there. And I, I uh, as you may know from the end of the book, I actually interviewed some of the people there. And I found her. They were very welcoming. I, maybe because I could speak French pretty well. They didn't, I think maybe it was important that I could speak French very well and that I tried to do homage to them, you know, their, their history. But they, they thought it was strange, but they, they, were, they were welcoming. So if any of you would just put this in a positive way or thinking of going over for, even right now, for the, I think you will find on the whole this a, a welcoming and an interest in America, you know, an exchange and and, uh, and so forth. So it's, things have changed since the early 50s. Yes? I was wondering how long did it take you to actually research and gather all the information for the return party here? Okay, the question was how long did it take to do this? Um, <coughs> well, uh, I Two, I say it was about two years till uh, I'm, I'm thinking because when I found them in France, they were working on it. I thought I would find a director and I'd have time. And I had only started working on Carras. I hadn't done all the arch I haven't been to the archives. And I had a quick, I had to work as fast, really, really fast uh, as we were doing the scenario. And then, uh, I had to turn in the book. Actually, it was at the same time, and it first came out in French, as the movie premiered in Paris. <coughs> so it was about, uh, it was two years. It was two years uh, just working as, you know, as hard as I could and rushing back and forth to France since I was teaching at Princeton at the time. So I, you know, I did like have, I couldn't just like take time off. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but uh, you could get, you know, you can get a great deal done. If you just, a very intent, work. You, you can really, uh, and that's one thing about being old. I think it was easier being old <laughs> in the sense that as you grow as an historian, I think you're finding this probably in your classes here when you return papers, the first time you sort of don't know where to find the stuff. Well, after you just get doing it, even if it's in a totally different area, because I never had worked in that part of France before. I worked in Lyon and Paris. You get to know where something is likely to be found. You know what I mean? And it's, it, you can do it faster. You get there, you still have to do the work, but you can get there, uh, you, you can get there and find it. And it's fun. I, I, somebody was asking me at dinner something about some of my, my work, and, and it's still the, I mean, I'm ta I was talking about, for you mostly about presentation for film, but the discovery is still a lot of fun. Uh, when you, you think you're gonna find I still remember the day that I finally found the actual court records for, for the case. Because I kept thinking, what if Karras made it all up and he published this book about it? 
Well, I knew that was unlikely. But when I actually found the court records, you know, the real thing in the court, I thought, okay, whew, you didn't make it up. <laughs> so, uh, I think over here and over there, yes? I'm curious about the economics of a movie like that. Make, uh, the French language has a big, as big a market as the English language. Did that movie make money in France and all that kind yes, of stuff? Yes, the movie has made money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, and it's got the subtitles. I do recommend, do you see it show it with subtitles? Yeah, Because it's, it's not well acted in the, in the English dubbing. It's very, very unfortunate. But it, it's done well. It's played in a lot of different places. In some cases, um, my book has helped a little for revivals, because my book has now come out in about a, a lot of different languages, uh, many different languages. And, and that's helped revival someplace. And um, um, it's done well. When, some of you have seen Summersby? Yeah. When Summersby came out, the people who were making it said, well, we're going to make millions of dollars. Martin Gare was in art theaters, but actually it wasn't just in, in art theaters. It, 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 did, it did well. It was, a, uh, it, was a success. it was a success. I don't know. I was on a, a salary, so I'm afraid I don't know. <laughs> I think there was one last question over here. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Professor Richard Slotkin. It's actually an American story. Yes, wonderful and stuff. And Gunfighter Nation he is the last of his trilogy on that series, but he talks about how American filmmakers always get it wrong, mm -hmm. some of being notwithstanding. And his point was that John Ford made the Calvary trilogy with John, with John Wayne yeah. in Monument Valley, and that became, for millions of Americans, the West. And it's almost nothing ever happened in Monument Valley, as far as the West is concerned. He's smiling because he knows about it. And the fact is, is there anything that you can think of, and I can think of some things myself, where it's become mythic in French history that this, all French think this happened, but never happened at it all. never happened at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, what the I'm sure we could find some examples uh, of that, uh, of uh, just completely wrong views. The reason I'm, and, and I appreciate, I'm very much of a fan of Richard Slotkin's work, and I think we've got to take very seriously that kind of, of, of well, I would call it falsification, no matter how imaginative it is. And John Ford is a very good, was a very good director and did try to do research. Um, but the reason I'm stuttering around is that I'm trying now to take, in this new book, a position which doesn't just look at the wrong things that films do, which they do, but also partly because I think it's a way to change things in filmmaking, to look at the, the right things that they do, or can and can even do better. That is the ways in which they sometimes try to, uh, <clears throat> to lay their script and their, all their work carefully on, on evidence from the past uh, and uh, make a story uh, that, that can be debated. Now let me say, make a second point. Uh, one thing that I noticed about spectators in the Martin Gare days, and they were all kinds, they weren't just art theater types, was that the audience was not passive. They didn't just sit there and think, oh, that's what happened. They usually would, I would hear them arguing after the theater, or if I was at the theater, they would argue with me or ask me questions. People wondered, well, did it really happen that way? And I think that's a very good attitude to stimulate, and I would love to see filmmakers do more of that um, by being more careful about their truth status. You know, if a movie is fictional and not about a historical character is fictional, then at the end say, uh, not any resemblance to persons living or dead is coincidental, or at the end do not say this is a true story. <laughs> At the end say, this is partly based on such, but we have fictionalized. So that you leave your audience the possibility of saying, hey, maybe that didn't happen in Monument Valley. But as I say, I have maybe naively a certain confidence in spectators and people being active in, in responding to films. Indeed, most of the very recent film theory, I'm thinking about high lit grit type theory in the last decade at least, all assumes an active spectator. And I want to extend that idea to activity beyond just active in regard to understanding the visual cues, but active in regard to thinking, gosh, I wonder if that's right. I think I'll talk to somebody about it. Maybe I'll go look at the library about it. 
uh, maybe the historical consultant, if there is one on the film, will do a radio show or a TV show or there'll be some dialogue. Do you see what I mean? And so that's what my hope would be to, to move to a situation where historical films can be in dialogue with history and with spectators. And I think we can, and maybe some of the young people in this room will make movies will be part of that. The question is, did my experience at Kingswood have anything to do with what I've become, the person I am? For sure. Uh, and even uh, in some curious way, I would, it, it could even fit into the, my interest in the Martin Gare story. Um, I, would, um, I would think of it, and there's so much to say about one's own years, at <coughs> very formative years, as you, you must all be feeling at a school, uh, in terms of general creativity, uh, I, uh, I was delighted to be at a place where my teachers, uh, women and men, I had a, man, uh, a ma male teacher for religion and women from other classes, um, took me really seriously as a girl, really bookish. And I, had, I really appreciated that, that very serious, that great seriousness. And it gave me a, a, something to go on and, uh, when I went to college. The same thing happened, I went to a woman's college. I, I was glad that I went to a girl's school. And I know that I'm very happy to see the way in which the co-education here has both the features, the best features of the Kingswood I knew and the best features of co-education. The second thing is more general. I mentioned the beauty of, of Kingswood and Cranbrook. And I, uh, somehow I feel that that helped create uh, a space for me, along with the books, a space, a creative space, uh, of, of an openness. Uh, and I don't know how to pin it down anything anymore, but something that I carried, uh, I always remember it. I carried through to other places that I've been. I, I, maybe I would add it by saying that, explain that by saying that every time I go to an archive, um, or a library, I mean, a, a library, working on a topic, that space, that place, which may be beautiful, it may not be such a beautiful, but it always gets connected with the project that I'm writing about. So when I think of Martin Gere, I partly think of the waterfall underneath the archive in, in the Pyrenees Mountains. I think of, especially when it's beautiful, or when I think of other things I wrote, I think of the fact that the archive was in a beautiful convent. And that gets all intersected with the scholarship. And I think that when I was young, the beauty the rooms, I still remember the library and the rugs and the hallways, somehow got connected and created a space. The third thing goes back to the idea of, of uh, imposters. And I, uh, that when I was at Kingswood, <clears throat> to tell a uh, more personal side, um, we had, there were quotas, like all kinds of quotas. And in my class, there were two Jewish girls per, I mean, that was it. I mean, that was it. That was the number of Jews that were allowed to be in the school. Totally different. I know it's completely open, and, and I don't even know if there were any Catholics at all. <laughs> I mean, not a bit. Uh, and there weren't any people of color. I mean, it was just, but we had, we had a great, I was, don't know if Toby would agree on this, but anyway. Anyway, that was the case. And I came to the school from a family that had come to America in the 19th century. They weren't brand new immigrants, but my grandparents, in one case, my great grandparents, were from the old country. Um, and I was from a different background, though I was not a fellowship student, a scholarship student. I was from a different background. But I loved the school. I loved being part of the, the group. But I always felt sort of different from the group. So I was both in it and out of it at the same time. And that, I feel, was a really, really important experience for me. Because it both made me want very much to be a success, the way we all did. And I was really, you know, on the student council and very cared about grades and all of that. But I also had a part of me that was different. And I had a part of me, the gentleman that asked the question about the, um, I think he's, he's made up here, but I, I said to the gentleman who asked the question about the Fisher Theater, Martin Gere, that, that Alain Bouvrio was interested in, in Martin Gere for some of the same reasons that I was. Well, he was, 
an immigrant from Tunisia to Paris, and he knew a lot about self-fashioning. And I knew about self-fashioning, not in the same way, but because I came into an environment which was different from the one, not, to that, not totally different, but somewhat different from my, my life in Detroit. Well, I think I said to you this afternoon that I had, had begun my book, Martin Gear with the movement from the Basque country of, of the Martin Gare family to the Long Duck and the changing of the language and the changing of the name. And that's what self-fashioning is about. So if you see the connection, in some ways, that experience at Kingswood of being both at the center of things but separate, and the experience of fashioning, as we all do, that is, you don't have to be a, a, a Jewish girl in a class of mostly Gentiles to have this experience. I think we all, in a high school or in college, we all go through this process of finding a way to be. But in my case, it just was very much associated with that, that somehow, when I came to write Martin Gere uh, about a book about self-fashioning, in that case about being an imposter, which I hope I wasn't, uh, but it fit together. It fit together. So it, I won't say that I got the idea when I was at Kingswood, but Kingswood was relevant <laughs> to that book. Well, now can I just hear from a classmate? I have to make a comment. Yes. Because I was director of admissions at Kingswood School in 1951. And it's totally no changed. There it was no, nothing like that, and we was, had welcomed people of color, and we never questioned anything. Yes, yeah, so it's, you know, it's completely that changed. Yeah. But in the earlier days, yeah, okay. yeah it, it was different in the earlier days. I mean, I'm glad it changed as rapidly as, as that. No, I didn't mean that as a slur. Yeah, it's you just time. Say. Yeah, no, I'm glad you did. No, times change. No, time, I'm happy that they change. I mean, they changed my at Smith College, and. That's a good thing. Things change. <laughs> Things change. So thank you for making that. I wanted to say, Nabby, thank you very much for this evening. You've taken us many places. And she's come from a distance, too. She's come from Toronto to be here today, and she will be in the school tomorrow. Um, there will be three, three periods in the day tomorrow when she will be talking with 10th grade students mostly, but I hope that other students can come by. Um, second, third, and seventh periods, and faculty are welcome also um, in the Kingswood Common Room. Now, again, thank you. I do want to say that she will be out here, and she will be signing the books that are for sale there, and she will sign your program if you would like that also, and there Time for further questions. Could we have some more applause for Natalie Davis? Thank you all for coming. Good to see you.